Are we on? There we are. <laughs> Welcome. Let's sing together. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Isn't it 
thank you for your name. How we praise you because of, of how good you are and because of your character. How we've just saying how you're our Lord, you're our Savior, you're the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so God, that's why we look to you today. We look to you for answers. We look to you for solutions for the issues, the problems, and, and maybe even the circumstances that we're in, God. And we realize that our prayer in, in those moments should not necessarily be to remove us from those circumstances, God, but to help us learn the lessons you want us to learn while we realize that you're with us, because that's what's the greatest gift is, is your presence. And so, God, we come to you today because of, of your character. You've, you've never failed us before, and we have no reason to believe that you're going you're gonna to start failing us today. So, God, we, we trust you because of your, your faithfulness, your love, your mercy, and your kindness. And, God, that's why we pray to you. That's why we look to your word for answers for our life. That's why we look to you for hope. And so, God, as we're looking for that hope today, God, let us find it. Let us find it in your word. Let us find it as we, we talk with one another and let us find it uh, through your spirit and the promptings and the encouragement that he gives us today. God, we love you and thank you for this day in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Oh. Uh -huh. 
Man, thank you so much. What a wonderful reminder for the uh, conclusion of this series that we're uh, finishing this morning as we've, over these last uh, four weeks, now the fifth week, been in this series of But God Meant It for Good. And someone asked me this week how I'm doing, and I said, I'm weary. They said, weary? I said, I've been preaching on suffering for four weeks, three times a Sunday. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm tired. <laughs> but as we've seen Joseph's struggle, I pray that more so we've seen God's character. And as we've seen his trial, I pray that more so we have seen God's sovereignty and God's faithfulness and God's goodness on grand display all through this text. And uh, I, we, let me assure you of this, we will not cover chapters 42 to chapter 50 this morning. We can't do all that. I'm going to give you some homework uh, for you to finish those chapters on your own. But this morning, I want to invite us to turn to chapter 45. So we see Joseph's interactions with his brothers. And as Joseph reveals his identity to his brothers, because some wonderful things have happened from where we left Joseph in being placed in second in charge of Egypt and the plan that he had to, to rescue the people and to store up food during the years of plenty to provide for the years of famine. and Much has happened in this engagement with Joseph's brothers in the chapters preceding chapter 45. His brothers come to Egypt to buy food at the behest of their father. And they come and they don't recognize him, but Joseph knows exactly who they are. And there's this wonderful uh, series of tricks that Joseph plays on his brothers. Filling their bags and then adding some extra and requiring the presence of another brother and inquiring about his father. And this wonderful exchange that leads up to chapter 45 And during this series, we as a church family have experienced grief. We as a church family have experienced trial and suffering. We've dealt with loss. We've dealt with pain and life-altering illness. And so these truths that we've examined are not merely theoretical and they're not theological calisthenics. These are real biblical truths that display the character of God and the glory of God and the goodness of God that we have experienced during these weeks. We have experienced the anchor holding in the midst of storm. And we continue to do so. And so just as God is faithful to Joseph, we thank God that he is faithful to us now, that God is unchanging. His character is not altered by circumstance. And so as we engage in this text this morning in anticipation of at the end of this service sharing in communion together, then I pray that, that we will be directed more to the glory of God in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of our trial, then we are overwhelmed and overcome by the circumstances in which we find ourselves. And so with that, let's turn our attention to the text in Genesis chapter 45. And remember the context here is that Joseph's brothers have come to buy food and there's this engagement and sending and back and forth and Joseph recognizes them, but they do not yet recognize him. Because remember, some time has passed from the time that they sold him into slavery until now. So in chapter 45, verse 1, Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. And he, he cried and said, everyone, Have everyone go out from me. So there was no man with him 
when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed at his presence. A world of emotions transpires in verse 3. Joseph overwhelmed. He can't contain himself any longer and, and reveals his identity to his brothers and inquires of his father and, and they are dismayed at his presence. That's such a kind way to put that. And Joseph said to his brothers, please come closer. And they came closer and he said, I am your brother Joseph whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years. And there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve you for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. And now therefore it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all of his household and ruler over all of the land of Egypt. Now hurry up and go to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me and do not delay. And you shall live in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me and you and your children and your children's children and your flocks and your herds and all that you have. There I will also provide for you. For there are still five years of famine to come, lest you and your household and all that you have be impoverished. And behold, your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see, that it is in my mouth, which is, that is my mouth which is speaking to you. Now you must tell my father of all of my splendor in Egypt and all that you have seen. And you must hurry and bring my father down here. And then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept on his neck. And he kissed all of his brothers. And he wept on them. And afterward his brothers talked with him. Now for today we're going to press pause there. This is an incredible narrative. After all that Joseph has been through, after all that he has endured, after all the reminders that we have through this narrative that God was with Joseph and God gave favor to Joseph, he has his brothers here at his mercy. And that is exactly what he gives them. He's overcome. And in this text, Joseph affirms three characteristics that we have seen woven through this text that have, as we might call it, given Joseph an eternal perspective. It doesn't seem that from the evidence we have in Scripture that Joseph has spent a lot of time focused with his attention only on his suffering, but rather in the larger picture of life after the dreams that God gives him early in the narrative, that that seems to have set his gaze on what God is doing in the midst of his trial and suffering. And so as we come to the end of this series and to this particular text, knowing what comes, that he reminds his brothers a few chapters later that God meant all of this for good, I want us this morning to be encouraged from Joseph's life and from Joseph's perspective how we might engage in our own trial with an eternal perspective. And the first thing that I want us to see is that an eternal perspective allows us to see God's purposes. Possessing an eternal perspective, a kingdom focus, if you will, allows us or 
or helps us to see God's purposes. Look in verse 5. Joseph tells his brothers, do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. They are dismayed at his presence. Joseph says, don't be grieved. Don't be angry that you sold me here. It's God. Now what I want us to catch here is some parallel truth. God's purposes are being accomplished. And the brothers' deeds were evil. (laughs) Don't think that what Joseph is saying is that you are really okay. No, he's recognizing what you did was evil, but don't be grieved over it. We want those parallel truths to intersect and, and reconcile. And here's the reconciliation. Sometimes people do evil things and God's purposes will still be accomplished. We want desperately in every situation like that for there to be some consistency and some continuity between causation and purpose and how do people's deeds, how do people's evil deeds fit within God's purposes and without God causing even breathe. God is good. Purposes are being accomplished. And sometimes people do evil things. And we might drive ourselves mad trying to figure out how parallel truths must intersect and must reconcile. Here's the reconciliation. God is good and people are not. God's purposes are larger than fallible people in their evil deeds. But Joseph says, don't be grieved that you sent me or that you sold me here. God's purposes are being accomplished. God sent me here. If you go back and do a word study here when it says that God sent me, there's, there's intent and purpose that's being displayed. I do believe that in God's sovereignty, sometimes he allows things and sometimes he causes things. And I'm not wise enough to always determine and understand which of those things are. But there is intent and purpose here in being displayed in verse 5. God's purpose was to move me from my home to Egypt. God sent me here. And having an eternal perspective allows us to see sometimes God's purposes being worked out even in the midst and through our own suffering. And now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. He recognizes the wrongness of their action but the rightness of God's purpose. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in this land two years, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent him with a purpose to preserve life. That's how far ahead of the curve God was working. To move him through this process to position him where he was so that his purposes could be accomplished. And in God's purpose being accomplished, the next thing that we see is God's faithfulness on display in verse 7. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Remember, we've talked about this, we've touched on this a couple different times, that God's faithfulness is not merely on display to Joseph, or now here to Joseph's brothers and his father, but all the way back to the promise that he made to Abraham. And here in this 
exercise of his faithfulness. God is being faithful to keep his word, to provide a remnant to continue the line that will one day end in the coming of the Messiah. So we talked about this, that Joseph's part of the narrative fits in the larger part of God's promise and God's faithfulness to fulfill his promises. So God is not merely being faithful to his servant Joseph, but faithful to keep his word, to keep his promise. And he does so in two different ways here. First of all, through provision. God sent me here to preserve you for a remnant in the earth to keep you alive by a great deliverance. He's, he's given them provision. They are, without this, they starve. There's no plowing, there's no harvesting, famine. Seven years worth. But yet God provides. And God is faithful to his promise. That may be one of the things that even in the midst of our own struggle, in our own trial, in our own difficulty, in our own circumstances, we need to be reminded of, of God's faithfulness to his own promise. One thing that God cannot do is he cannot deny himself. So if God said, I will do this, then what will happen? He will do it because God's character. He cannot lie and he cannot deny himself. The, thing, the only thing that obligates God is his own word. So when God makes a promise, he keeps it. I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. In the midst of your trial, you may feel very alone, but there's, there's a term in golf that feel isn't real. If you play golf, if you've ever tried to play golf, you know what that's like because you might say, well, my swing feels really good, and then you see it on camera and think, there's no reason that should feel good because feel isn't real. Because it may feel good and not get the right result and something horribly wrong has happened even in the midst of your feelings that will lie. God never lies. God's never not faithful to his own word. So having an eternal perspective enables us and helps us and allows us to see God's faithfulness at work. The problem comes in the midst of us trying to see God's purposes and God's faithfulness, is that, that our emotions tend to scream very loudly. They really want our attention and our affection and our loyalty. But in the midst of trial, when our feelings are calling for our loyalties, we must submit them to the truth of what God's Word says. Now, it doesn't mean that we dismiss the realities of how we feel, but rather we bring those into the submission of the truth of God's word. And so we see God's purpose. We see God's faithfulness. And as we continue through the text, we see God's sovereignty. We've seen these three characteristics woven throughout the entirety of this text. Earlier this week, I brought this outline to several other of our pastors, and I said, this feels a bit redundant from what we've talked about the last few weeks, and their response was, okay. But these are the three primary truths that are woven through this text. That God is purposeful. We talked about that. The suffering is purposeful. It's not all punitive, but it's all purposeful. We talked about that in week one. And in the midst of our sufferings, God is faithful. He does not abandon us. He does not leave us. He's working to accomplish his purpose through his faithfulness and in the midst of his sovereignty, under the umbrella of his sovereignty. That there was no one equal or akin to him in his power, in his character, in his perfection. That God is sovereign. We see that in the text. Verse 8. Now therefore it was not you who sent me here but God. Again he speaks of causation. You wanted to get rid of me but God was up to something larger. 
They were dismayed at Joseph's presence because they were concerned about their own actions. Joseph brings an eternal perspective here and says, yeah, your deeds were evil. But you were just a player in the process. God, in his sovereignty, sent me here to accomplish his purpose because he's faithful to keep his word. And when we come to trial and struggle and difficulty and and pain and, and all those things that come along with it, We want to get to the chapter 45 and the chapter 50 of our own struggle and put a bow on top of it. And sometimes it works that way and sometimes it doesn't. But God is faithful. And God is good. He's purposeful. We can rest in that. But in the midst of seeing these these three truths, again, being woven through this narrative, there are a couple of very practical, relational things that we can see from this particular portion of the text that very often calls us increased trial and difficulty in the midst of our struggle when we see here what an eternal perspective can do for us relationally, not just as we relate to God, but as we also relate to one another. And having an eternal perspective helps us to be able to forgive. In week one, we talked about the fact that not all trial or difficulty is punitive or or disciplinary, but it's all purposeful. God is always at work in it. And that sometimes we have trial because we live in the fallen world and it's just the results of living in a world under the fall. Sometimes we struggle by sinful decisions that we make. But sometimes we do have trial because of the sinful decisions that someone else makes. Sometimes we wrestle, sometimes we struggle, sometimes we have trial because we are betrayed by evil people with evil deeds. But I dare say none of us have experienced what Joseph experienced to be sold into slavery and abandoned by his family with great intent, that that seemed to be a better option than killing him. But yet we've all got our own story where we've dealt with people who hurt us in some way or wounded us in some way. And when we experience that, when we experience that kind of pain or, or difficulty or struggle or suffering, uh, it has, uh, that pain sent, tends to call for our attention. I've shared with you the story several years ago about when I burned the tip of my index finger on a car cigarette lighter. Some of you may recall that. I'll tell a brief version of it uh, because it was one of the dumber things I've ever done in my life. I was 12 years old, got locked out of the house, but yet the car was unlocked. What could go wrong? So horsing around in the car, I pushed the little thing in. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about because you use that as a phone charger. But back in the day, you had a little metal thing in it. You could push it in, and when it got hot, it would come out, and you pulled it out, and people lit cigarettes off of it. Now you're thinking, this is the most unspiritual part of this message. Just context. And I thought, that's supposed to be hot, but it doesn't look red. It was hot. Now remember context, I'm locked out of my house. Nobody's home. And yet, and if you remember, I had to go all the way around my neighborhood, halfway around the the one-mile circle before I found somebody at home. In my neighborhood, everybody knew everybody, and so when a neighbor kid knocks on the door, everybody answers it, but I just, all I could get out was ice. It wasn't a large, you know, my body wasn't covered in burnt... It was only the tip of my index finger, but from the time I touched it, every molecule in my body knew that I had been hurt. And when we encounter hurt at the hands of others, we're infinitely aware. And if we're not careful, that becomes the grid through which we interpret everything. We interpret everything that comes 
through our hurt. Joseph, his brothers are before him, and he said, do not be grieved. Don't be grieved. That you, the word forgiveness never shows up in this text. But the portrait that is painted gives a beautiful picture of grace. You, you treated me horribly, but God's picture was bigger. Don't be grieved or angry with yourself because you sold me here. He's not dismissing what happened. He recognizes their action, but that God's purposes are larger than their action. What God has done in and for him through their action is larger. And seeing his struggle through that eternal perspective compels him and moves him to to bring grace and mercy and forgiveness to those who have betrayed him the worst. Don't be angry or grieved. God sent me here. He brings forgiveness to them because he's able to see through not the grid of his own trial or suffering, but rather through the grid of God's purposes and God's faithfulness and God's sovereignty to bring him here that God was at work even in the midst of his pain. And that forgiveness helps relationships to be restored. I want to draw our attention to the last verse that we read this morning. Last two verses, look at verse 14. Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept on his neck. He kissed all of his brothers, and he wept on them, and afterwards his brothers talked with him. We see three things here in the way that Joseph expresses this restoration of relationship in in Joseph forgiving his brothers, but that Joseph weeps on his brother Benjamin's neck and Benjamin on his, and he kisses all of his brothers. There's this this physical picture of receptivity that Joseph brings to his brothers. He forgives them, he kisses them, he receives them. But look at the last phrase in verse 15. And afterwards, his brothers talked with him. Do you remember back in chapter 37? Jacob loved Joseph more than all of his other brothers, all of his other sons. And his brothers could not even speak with him on friendly terms. Full circle. God's purposes being worked out, God's faithfulness on display, God's sovereignty through this whole narrative bringing about not only God's faithfulness and provision to his own promise to Abraham, but rather not just that, but also this restoration of family relationship. Because Joseph is able to have this eternal perspective that sees God's hand at work in all of these things. And the it gives the appearance that the brothers are moved in their opinion of Joseph from being not able to speak to him, but now they're able to receive the reception that they're given. But then we also know that five chapters from now, after their father dies, they're going to come back and say, now, Joseph... Just to to reaffirm the the fact that you're not going to have us killed now that our fathers died. And Joseph reminds them, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God's purpose, God's faithfulness, God's sovereignty to his servant, to 
save and deliver them to keep a remnant that will one day lead to the coming of the Messiah. We're still God's purpose and God's faithfulness and God's sovereignty on display. That he might forgive us and that our relationship with him would be restored. And so it's good and right this morning that as we come to the end of this series that we also share in communion together. So I'm going to invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes and those who are going to help this morning are moving into their place to do so. And if you are uh, here with us, we want you to be able to uh, participate as God would allow you. And I'm going to lead us in prayer and then David's going to lead us through our time of communion. As we celebrate God's goodness, God's purpose, God's faithfulness, God's sovereignty, His mercy, His grace through the sending of His Son. And so, Father God, we thank You for Your goodness to us. I pray, Lord, that through these weeks that we have lifted high the name of Jesus, that we have lifted high Your character, and that while we as a church family have indeed suffered and dealt with loss and grief and difficulty and trial, even in these weeks, I pray that we have experienced your character, recognizing your purposes, seeing your faithfulness, enjoying living under your sovereign care. And we thank you this morning for the opportunity to come to your table. to celebrate how ultimately you have given us relationship with you. We thank you for this time. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I'm very grateful to be able to uh, partake of the Lord's Supper together today. I just want to ask you guys to bow your head and close your eyes and just be in a, I guess, a, a posture and an attitude of prayer. I've got, I'm going to ask the guys if you guys would come forward and go ahead and hand out the elements today. If you're watching us online, this would be a very appropriate time for maybe the best time for you to go ahead and get your elements, whether it's a chip or a cracker or some kind of juice, then you can partake with us. But as we're in a Uh, really a a posture of prayer and just a a time of of meditation and focus, allowing God to search our hearts. I want to read a few things over us today, some great reminders, maybe even a little bit of direction on what specifically to ask God to do in our hearts during this time before we celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Here's something that I heard a a couple weeks ago, and I think it's, it's very fitting. My sin is way worse and more destructive than I believe it to be. But God's grace is far better and offers more healing than I could ever imagine. And that's why the worst thing that has ever happened can also be the best thing that will ever happen. That's that's the cross. Like the worst thing that ever happened to someone, to an innocent person, to Jesus our Savior, is also the best thing because he used that moment and that time and that, that... the thing that was set forth before the beginning of time to happen for our salvation. That's why it can be the worst thing and the best thing at the same time. And so that's something for us to to focus on and to think about and to allow God to search our heart for today. Whether maybe there's some things between us and him. Uh, Last month when we did this, we spent some very specific time in some specific areas, Uh, but now I just want to give you a few moments, just a little bit differently today, but but also kind of the same, give you just a few moments to allow God to search your heart. Ask Him to be specific, because I found that when you do, He will. He'll be very specific and reveal things that are between you and Him, because He ultimately died to make a relationship with us possible, and He wants us to live and walk in, in fellowship inside of that relationship and with nothing hindering us. And so if there's something that you know that's hindering, go ahead and, and use this time to confess that. Or 
If you feel like there's something there, but maybe you can't put your finger on it, ask God to, to search your heart and reveal that to you. So I'll, I'll give us a couple moments while Cheryl's playing uh, to allow God to search our hearts. We always want to be specific in our admission of our weaknesses, and we want to surrender and submit to Jesus, our Savior. He calls us to humbly admit our dependence on him. Uh, coming to the table is our chance to do this. It's a chance to show him that we humbly submit to the plan that he has for us and the way that he would like us to follow him. And so we remember that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he gave thanks to his father for it while he was there in that room with the disciples, and then he broke it. And he looked at them and he said, do this in remembrance of me. So let's take our bread, let's eat, remember, and believe. Jesus went on to say this, this cup is the new covenant between God and you, sealed by the shedding of my blood. So do this in remembrance of me. So let's take and drink, remember, and believe. God, you are you're so good to us that you give us a chance to remember, especially when we are such a forgetful people. God, you've done so much. You've brought us, brought us through so many things, and yet when we're facing what we're facing right now, it's like we've forgotten everything you've done. So God, for, forgive us for our forgetfulness, but thank you that you do so many things in our lives to call us back to remembering your character, your goodness, your love for us, and, and God, that you would send your son to die for us. God, we, we can't imagine that. We cannot imagine giving up our one and only son for enemies of ours, for people who are totally opposed to us. And yet, that's what you've done for each of us. So God, thank you for doing that. Thank you for a chance to celebrate that today. We love you. And thank you for all you do and all you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all so much for being here today. There, uh, This will be a great time. If you haven't already, use the envelope in front of you to share your prayer requests with us. That's, a way, that's one of the ways. There are many ways uh, that you can give to our church and to other different missions and opportunities that we have going on through the church. Uh, one specific example of that is what's wrapping up this week. That is the Shoes for Orphan Souls, that you can continue to give uh, socks, shoes, and even money if you'd rather not do the shopping yourself uh, through Wednesday. And then we've got to take those and deliver those on Friday to an area church, and then they'll get it to the next step in the process and, and so on and so forth, and it'll be great. But I want to say thanks so much. I mean, the barrel out there is full. That doesn't mean we don't need more, but um, and that other people can't use more because we've watched that video now a couple times this month. Like, it, it's not just a pair of shoes. You're, you're, you're offering hope and you're giving hope and you're giving this organization an opportunity to meet a very real physical need and also uh, open them up to the gospel, give them an opportunity to share the gospel clearly with them. So, so what a great opportunity. Um, but remember, we want to we wanna pray with you. We want to encourage you if you have questions about some things that Brian has said specifically uh, about knowing Jesus and, and having a relationship with him or growing in him after you already know him initially, uh, we would love to help answer those questions. And so a way to do that is through your app online, through the, um, the Get Connected and Info uh, area there on the tab, but also um, uh, through the envelope here at church. And then you can just put those in the orange buckets on your way out. But thank you guys for, for coming today. Hope you have a great and fantastic rest of your Sunday and Sunday school. We'll see you soon.